Now let me deal with the forces that shape human behavior. There are a lot of people who are sincere, who really do not know what the factors are that shape our behavior. And so they think that some people are born gifted, some people have the right genes, or some people have criminal genes, or some people have artistic genes. Hanging it on the genes is a real easy way out. The geneticist, all you get in the genes, the color of the eyes, the skin, the type of tissue, the brain tissue you have, but no ideas. Ideas come from culture. If you can see this blackboard, it will help a great deal. I don't know if the chalk is very visible. This is a bad drawing of a side view of a person. And when you, a person looks out this way and you hold up a symbol, that symbol falls on the back of the retina. And somebody, that symbol falls in the back of the retina as a distribution of light and shade. And that goes into the brain, to the optic nerve, where there are about seven million cables coming out of this, into neurons. And somebody says, cross. And the word cross is associated with the image cross. Then you touch it. You know the shape of it. That comes into the tactile memory, which links up with that. Some people have a memory linkage on different systems of maybe 4,000 links. Some have seven links. Many full-grown adults are neurally bankrupt, meaning they don't have enough associative systems to put things together. So they see something happen, and they can't account for it, so they invented a word, instinct. They do it instinctively. So instead of saying, I have no idea of how fish can find the Orinoco River thousands of miles away and swim up to that river to the spawning ground without any other fish opening a map, say, here's the way you go, boys. This is the direction. Nothing, none of that. They know, they do it. So we don't know how that's done, so they invented the word instinct. They didn't say, I have the slightest idea of how it goes. That's the honest thing. If you're religious, it says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Say, when something, a person appears to be artistic at a very young age, I guess they were born that way. Just say, I don't know how that works. It's much easier to say that. Now, when you're familiar with it, people come up to me and say, well, you're an inventor. You, you are, they use all kinds of labels. And they say, you must be born that way. And, and you have the type of mind that Edison has. They say, well, what type of mind is that? Well, they don't know. So if you really want to understand how the human brain works, I'm going to try. I don't know that I can communicate how we work. Human beings can only look at something in terms of their background. When somebody says, will you design a house for me? I know what they mean by a house. Something like that. Okay? That's a house. Maybe, maybe they hang a little thing off here. Okay? Something like that. Maybe they put a chair in here. Okay? That's a house. But this isn't a house. Who wants to live in that? Wasn't that a dome? I wouldn't want to live in that. We all live in a dome. Your brain is in a dome. Whether you like domes or not, they are the strongest shape. How many of you here ever try to cross, crush an egg? How many of you ever tried to do that? It's extremely difficult. It's the most efficient shape. If you don't like that, I don't like this. You buy a wooden house, I don't care what you pay for it, you can burn to the ground in 20 minutes. And then the environmentalists, who are so concerned about the forest, not cutting down the forest, most of them live in wooden houses. So, if you live in a concrete house, you have no termites, you have no fire, no fire insurance, and if you use a light webbing of whether it be carbon fibers, through it, even in an earthquake, if it's split in half, it wouldn't cave in. We sit in judgment of something new with our old value systems. The first automobile, I don't know, well, many of you are familiar with this, but it looked a lot like this. The first automobile. And they put curtains here. They didn't sell too well. And then a guy put a dummy horse's head on it. I don't know how many they knew. And they sold better. You can't quite change it that fast. How many have ever seen that early automobile with a horse's head on it? All right. Now, people can't quite let go. How then is it that the human being can invent things and has a mind like the wheel. 
who invented the wheel? I never tell you that. Obviously, when a tree falls over in the forest, bad drawing of a log, and a tree is lying across it this way, if you pick up this log and pull it, that one rolls and it makes it easy to pull. No one invented the wheel. It was discovered this way. Nobody ever invented anything. The human brain cannot put anything together unless it had an experience or a reference for it. There is no way that we know for any information to get into your brain except through touch, smell, sight. Your brain is clean when you're very young. It's very clean. And in comes sound, mama, daddy, gaga, gaga. When did you learn to speak English? Saturday, April the 5th? First it's gaga, gaga, yeah. And finally, it builds up into a series. It took an electrical engineer of 75 years ago and put a transistorized circuit in his hand and said, what do you think? He'd look at it and do nothing with that. Because never having seen that, he cannot, he cannot say, ah, a transistorized circuit. Even if he looked it under a microscope, he wouldn't know what he was looking at. If you give a cannibal a wristwatch and say, what do you think? It's hell of an interesting way to keep time, boys, isn't it? No, he can't do that. They have no associative memory for that. I'm trying to say something very significant, and that is that human beings, whatever I say about people, I'm talking about myself, cannot think or reason. These are illusions that are put forth by people in high places. They talk of body and mind, brain and mind. There's no separation. It's like a battery and it's electricity. They're all part of the same thing. The trees, the life around us, we are all one gigantic interconnection. The separation, when you teach a person to be a physiologist, you're making a jerk. When a person is trained to be an electrical engineer, is another jerk. When there's no such thing as a scientist. Remember this. There are people that are scientific in botany. When it comes to human behavior, they know nothing about it. Literature, very little information. So don't look for scientists for guidance. They're just as dumb as anyone else. Anyone else brought up in the culture. Again, there are people that are scientific in human behavior, can't repair electronic equipment. They're illiterate in that area. So when they use the term in many universities that too many people are illiterate, the dean of the university, I asked him some questions. I said, are you familiar with a culture effect or a carousel? He said, no. I said, you're right. A lot of people are illiterate in different areas. So stop looking to scientists for guidance. They don't know any more about the subject of social design than most of us. You know, Vannevar Bush said the atom bomb would never go off. Edison was supposedly the inventor of the camera, the movie camera, and they said, what do you think its future would be? It would be a passing fad. So don't think that the experts have the answer. They are only in their narrow discipline, working from that frame of reference. Architects that go to school dream of new worlds, and new types of buildings. Then when they get out of school, school they're pushed back into the mold. A house looks like this, okay? and you put all the gingerbread that you can put on it, hang all kinds of crap on it, false roofs, another additional roof up here, one hanging out that way. You talk about energy waste, our whole society, our value system, our language belongs in the dismal past. Our language today that we learn, that we are taught in school, makes it almost impossible for us to share ideas. But how do you know what you're ever talking about? What intelligence is, is the ability to extract significance from a situation, any situation that you look at. Even it's significant when you say, I don't know enough about the subject, to make a decision. Once somebody asked Stuart Chase at a meeting a certain question, kind of an in-depth question, and he stood up and he said, I honestly don't know the answer to that. And everybody stood up and said, you know, that, that is very rare. There's no such thing as intelligent life yet on earth. <laughs> Our society, all your presidents, I'm sorry to say this, was cerebral insufficiency all the way back in time. They're very ignorant men. You can tell that anyone who wants to become a president of a half-developed society has got to be sick. 
Imagine a guy being a dentist, want to drill into a rather rotten teeth all his life, looking up to that profession. And they look up to that. Here's a doctor all day long looking at sick people. And medicine, people in medicine say, the purpose of the eyebrow is to catch a drop of sweat, pass it to the side. They look at everything with purpose. They think there's a purpose to life. Now let me show you, there's an animal called a triceratops. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a dinosaur with three horns and a heavy collarbone, like that. Well, the purpose of this collarbone is to counterweight the head. Oh, the purpose of these horns are to ram other animals. Everywhere. That's, that doesn't make sense. So you finally find a rhinoceros with the horn going the wrong way. It goes the other way. Yeah, if you don't understand me, this is a rhinoceros head with a horn going the wrong way. What's that for? Are you getting underneath and bucking? And then there are animals with horns that go like that. What's that for? There are animals with horns that go back that way. This is the animal. Horns go back that way. What's that for? Some go off to the side. Animals are born with every which way horn. And if you were born with a bony growth on your shoulder and somebody locked you in a closet, you'd push, shove, boom, and that'll get you out. So you use the bony area that way. There's no intelligence in nature. Everybody looks at him. You being so wonderfully built, in schools of anatomy, they show you how wonderful the human being is. Well, if the human being were wonderful, they'd have two holes that run upward, not a projection forward. Because when you fall, you smash the corpulentous substance, and you got all trouble breathing all your life. Children, little children, would have balls of fat under the arm and arm and knee, and if they became more stable and didn't fall as much, the fat would begin to disappear. But you know, life is intelligent. Life is a clock. Let me tell you a lot about life. When you look at life from a scientific point of view, it has no purpose and no direction. Otherwise, if you're going to say the purpose of the nails are to scratch an itch or to pick insects off, then you have to say the purpose of a sneeze is to infect other people in the room. <laughs> Hacking and coughing <coughs> infects a hell of a lot of people. So hang your purpose into everything, you find out it's ridiculous. We've been brought up, a lot of us, with religion. And the dangers of religion talk about purpose. Only the purpose of the sun is to light the earth. Now, as you know, most of you know today, that the earth would be about this size, alongside the portion of the sun. And if God puts this tremendous unit up there to light this wee little thing up here, it's a bad engineer. <laughs> 93 million miles away. Now, then they say the purpose of the stars is so we can find our way at night. Now you know the stars are millions and millions of light years away. So they must be up there for some reason. Then the purpose of disease is to wipe out people. You see? So you say, well, what's that have to do with human beings being the most intelligent form of life? Who said that? Human beings. They put themselves on the pedestal. The whole universe, the earth, was built for them. Highest form of life. The inventor of the rack, the torture chamber, the men, the men, mostly men, who destroyed the earth, dumped toxic materials into the oceans, blasted the hell out of other civilizations. Year in and year out, they have a lousy record. It's a sick culture that will not even be retained or remembered or written about in the future. It would make the people of the future sick. Don't look at yourself. Man's the highest form of life. He's the biggest idiot that ever lived. If you look at what he's done to the earth and what he's done to his fellow man, even though they go to church, they blast one another, priests bless tanks, you know, as they say, don't kill your brothers. Don't you remember? Don't you remember what Christ taught, tried to teach? Man is a very limited animal. And we are at the early stages. This is the tail end of the Middle Ages. Now, we've got a brain. And to develop that brain, you've got to go to work. Lazy man gets out of his yard and had not rain for six months and my plants are drying out. It's easy to dig a ditch and irrigate the area. But no, they turn to the deity. The danger, people say, why are you always talking about religion? Why don't you let it go? Because unfortunately, there's too many statements made that we shall always have the poor amongst us. That's dangerous. We won't have anything. We can work out anything if we put our mind to it, study it, do hard work instead of find simple answers. The reason he behaved that way is because he's criminal type. You know, look at his head, you see? And, and there's no criminal type. 
If somebody said to me, in your society, what are you going to do with a criminal? I cannot imagine criminal behavior in the new society. Criminal behavior is when you go into a supermarket today, and don't take my word for it, buy a box of cornflakes or anything else, and then open the cover, and you'll see that it's way down. <laughs> what do you mean by criminal behavior? <laughs> now, criminal behavior is during the war, they made jeeps and army trucks very tall. And a lot of them used to turn over. And why were they so tall? They said, well, to clear muddy roads and the tall grass. But the differential, this part of the car, was always at the same height. And that doesn't help them. The reason they were made that tall is they were made about two and a half feet above standard loading platform. So when the war ended, you couldn't auction them off. They'd have to order new trucks and new cars. And that's what it's about. That's what it's about. The Vietnam War, the Gulf War, it's about money, about oil, not about better living, improving the lifestyle of people. They won't even remember the president's names of this country. It'll be stricken. And the new history books will show that one man grabbed land from another man, one nation took things from another nation, that all history is loaded with corruption. We came to this country because we were dissatisfied with the countries we lived in before. For whatever reasons, they didn't permit your freedom of religion. And when we got here, there were people living here. And we drove them out to the dry desert regions. And we slaughtered the buffalo that they needed to live on. And then we made hundreds of treaties and broke most of them. And so I said, what are you going to do with the criminals? We are all criminals in this kind of society. All of doctors send you down for additional x-rays that you don't need. They're in a position of differential advantage. So I've got nothing against criminals. They're byproducts of this culture. All I can say, if you want a better world, you'd better work out an operating system to control that. So they say, well, why won't there be crime with the society you propose? Why should it be any better? Because it's not in the hands of man. So if you want to move, from a primitive civilization to an advanced civilization, you have to learn a new language. And the new language is based upon physical reference. In other words, if you have a river flowing for many years in this direction, and then it, you cut it square like that, that river will eat away the land and shape it differently by the forces in the water. To extrapolate the future based upon physical movement, is the way to understand it. It takes a long time. It's hard work. That's why ignorance prevails. When somebody gets me, how can we make the world a better place? You say, do you have three years? How much time do you got? They want an answer like that. You got to get rid of the goddamn fires, then the blacks, and then the redheads. You know, whatever it is, that's easy to understand. That's why ignorance prevails. It is easy to understand. Get rid of them. Take the goddamn criminal, put them in jail, throw the key away. That means you give medical care for life, dental care for life, feed them for life. And the real answer is that in the center of our city, we have uh, these eight little domes. And any child can go in there and say, <coughs> I'd like to check out a camera, just like the library. And there's a camera. We say, what do you want to do with it? Well, I love animals. Take pictures of animals, bring the camera back, take care of the camera, then you can take a bigger camera with more equipment on it, and we teach him photography. Another kid says, I'd like to play the violin. They have a library. He can check out a violin. Any kind of musical instrument, microscope, chemistry set, make it available. Make stainless steel bicycles, hundreds of them, so kids can check them out. They won't steal anything. That's why they didn't steal anything in the South Seas. I, I used to say to the natives when I lived there, how come you give me fish and fruit and berries? It goes all over the place. You know, why should we hang a price on it? They never invented money. And the Polynesians, in the early days, had no word for work. Did you know that? They played all day. And how did they live that way? Watch them. They had a great time. They had luau's, feasts, dances, rowing, underwater swimming. They didn't work. I mean, they had no need to. Imagine if it rained gold for three months. Here. And the streets were filled with You'd take your rings off and throw them away. So they try to control people. Money is a control device.
by paying you minimum wage, you got to come in tomorrow if you want to eat. So all of this was really part of a giant plan in which people manipulate certain variables which control your behavior. The books you read, your school you go to, just raise your right hand and pledge allegiance to the flag, and you get up and say, first, I'd like to know more about other countries, their philosophy, how they operate. Perhaps I might not want to do that. I, why don't we pledge allegiance to the Earth to take good care of it? If we depend too much on machine technology, wouldn't that hurt the human being? And what will people do if you use all the machinery you talk about in your books, Jock? What will people do? Well, in the very early days, I'm going to exaggerate here, there was a unit that looked something like this. And a lot of humans used to push that around in a circle to pump water, do whatever they wanted to do. And they pushed it around. But the guy's wife, she had to go down to the river with a stretcher on her shoulder with two pails of water, bring it up in the river, and pour it in the house in a container. And then she'd go out and remove animal fat and reduce it and produce a lubricant or an oil for a lamp. And you said, well, if you could automate that, man, the point, what would people do? And if the wife had to go down to the river and didn't bring the water, and she said, what would women do? Well, all she does today is turn the little knob and gets all the water she wants, hot or cold. And she wants light, so you don't have to skin an animal, take the fat, reduce it, put it in the lamp, light it. She presses the button. She turns a little yellow and light gets brighter or darker. So did that, what would people do if automation comes in? Imagine art centers, music centers, creative centers, work stinks. It's below human beings. It's boring, monotonous, and robs you of the best years of your life. Think of a young lady, 18 years old, typing the best years of her life for some corporation. When she retires, what has she got up here? Corporate letters. How will you handle aggressor nations? Here's how we handle aggressor nations. There's a universal language that exists today that's understood and accepted by all nations. That's the blueprint. I go to Japan, I open a blueprint on electronics. They know what you're talking about. You open a blueprint on agriculture. They know what you're talking about. You open a blueprint on architecture. They know what you're talking about. You can communicate. Agronomy, and if you talk about God or religion or politics, you're dead. So the universal language is technology. It's accepted now all over the world. The beginning of the scientific age will occur when all the nations join together and utilize the earth for the benefit of all beings and sharing of all knowledge. It would be only constructive direct direction and information, and all information would be designed to enhance the lives everyone. That's the purpose of the being. It has no seven laws of wisdom. It says that everything we've learned up to now is the best we know up to now. As you can improve things as you go to hospitals, wherever you go, improve it. Keep changing. And your language will change. you become more precise. Children won't fight. You'll see no debates. Debates are dangerous. Because you've got up, if you got up in a Lutheran church and debated, and you were a Catholic, and a Lutheran audience. A Lutheran would win. So if you come up with new ideas, you should be given nine hours against his one hour, because you're dealing with a new idea. See? So in the future, instead of debate, we have dialogue, where you sit down and discuss them. Not argue, not call people names, you discuss them. And you share ideas to whatever extent you can. But you don't use such terms like, I don't think that'll work. You say, the reason it won't work is because this area cannot support that kind of structure. But if you use the language of, yeah, you'll never see that, how many of you thought you'd see man on the moon in your lifetime? Would you raise your hand? Very few people. Think. So if you ask the majority of people, what kind of government do you want, what do you think you're going to get? Well, they know. Democracy is ridiculous. There's no such thing. There's no free enterprise system. It's not free. Before you open a liquor store, you've got to hand it up for a lot of money. You have to sell them. And so there's nothing free. Communism was never communistic. The free enterprise system was not free, nor is it enterprising. They stifle things. To talk about the Venus Project comprehensively would really be a waste of time until you know the philosophy underlying it, that we look at people as having been brought up to a certain value system. They can be brought up 
with a more appropriate set of values. There's no such thing when I say as right and wrong, there is more appropriate behavior, and then as time goes on, there's much more appropriate behavior. So we're changing organisms, and we learn to do things better, and we evolve. Oh, if you write the seven laws of wisdom, you try, you're fixing things, see? So I'm talking about a whole new way of doing things. There's some people out there that are trying to make life better for the older folks. There's some people who want to do black studies, polar studies, Greek study, women's rights, there's a major problem with this redesign of our culture so that everyone grows and benefits. There's no elitist class, no technical class that tells you what to do or how to do it. They give you the best tools they have and say, take it from their side. Basically, that's what the Venus Project is about. Now, I'm sure I didn't mean to hurt any of you, and so tear it to pieces now. Come at it. If there's anything you don't quite understand, I will try to answer the question. Uh, your opinion on the welfare state. The welfare state? The wel welfare state, you know. The well, that's part of our social evolution. Uh, all countries have a welfare. No, industry is in the, um, in the welfare department, too. When, in, when the government wants a new airplane, they put the bill. They pay industry to do it. Right. They use your money to do it. And also, if you don't remember this, during World War II, you went to a movie and says, buy war bonds and bring Johnny home faster. You know who paid for that ad? To get yourself to buy more bonds? You paid to convince yourself to buy more bonds. That's what those ads are. So, so everything you've got in this country is, is so, I don't even know where to start. It just isn't even worth talking about. The world I'm talking about is a different kind of world where we share ideas and we honestly disagree with one another and we don't fight over it. We said, let's test this and say, well, what, what, what works we use? Somebody said, what if somebody wants to build a sweat forward link, the other guy wants to build a sweat backward? Why do you have to sweat if you want to build five different sites? See how they work? Only, well, who's going to make the decision? You don't need that. You only do that in this kind of system. Where you dig up nickels and dimes for, for heart disease, cystic fibrosis, whereas here, we give the medical center whatever they need because there's enough glass out there, obsidian, to make 7,000 microscopes for every human alive. You look at World War II, I pointed out before, there's 5,500 ships on the bottom of the sea, 800,000 aircraft. Isn't it easier to go to any country to help them be healthier? What are you building warships for? It's a very sick society. It doesn't, you say, well, the men of the War Department are intelligent men in that restricted area of destructive technology. But in the future, children will be trained as generals. You couldn't come out of school as a medical doctor or a mechanical engineer. You have to study sociology, the origin of behavior, how we get to be as we are, what makes kids have incentive or not have incentive. You study all that. So when someone says, ah, you're an electrical engineer, we need a rocket that will have, that, and we need an electrical system that will cause the rocket the projectiles to go to different cities all on one rocket. Oh, he says, that's fascinating. I'd love to work on that. No, he's, he's not a human being anymore. But what, what about human beings? There are very few human beings. People that take a bayonet, they slip it in the jacks, you know, cut them open. You say, all the young boys that died in the war, really, what's a human being? A human being is one that's brought up as a generalist and say, I want to hear the Japanese side of the story. I want to hear all sides of the story. So in a democracy, the president will come on the air for one hour, an hour and a half, and criticize some country. When he's through, we have a representative of that country come on the air for an hour and a half. Say, let me tell you where he's wrong. And let me point out how we see it. Then you have a guy come on from Sweden who says, they're both wrong. Let me tell you how we see it. See, that's a democracy. But you've got one point of view going all the time in one country. You don't need an iron curtain or a wall. It exists in the upbringing of your children. We are brought up not to be sane. That's why psychiatry and psychology is a good business. You know, they're supposed to help you. If a guy comes to a psychiatrist and says, I have a great many economic problems, weighs upon me, I can't find my kid, he supposed to 60 bucks an hour, keep your so, There is a, everybody makes a buck on you. You get a dental infection, $1,200, can you pay it? Well, if I bang into her car, he makes $2,000 bringing me out your pension. That's the kind of world you're in. So how can you have decency? And they all go to church. Oh, crap. 
think about it. All right. Now, I will open this section for questions. Don't be polite. Honestly, just be clean. Don't be polite. I know. Yes. Given that there would, assuming that there would still be all kinds of differences in opinion about all kinds of matters, uh, even with an abundance of goods, uh, how, how, where would voting represented the democracy? Where would what? Voting. There's no voting. You use cybernetic systems. You know, automobile factories, I'm sure you know this, can turn down cars without people. Electronic, they do 45 wells a minute. Like, is there a guy under there? Well, that's gone. Where are the elevator operators? I think some of you remember when a guy or a girl used to turn a little knob and they couldn't quite get you to the floor and go up and down. Now you say, in a, in a very advanced building, you go in, it'll say what floor? And you say 17. I beg your pardon? 17. If you dial, this is 800 number, 1-800-WILDFLOWER. How many of you know about it? All big industries are installing automatic voice systems that understand language. You can call in to a big industrial plant, they like to speak to the chief engineer. They'll say, he's in conference now. What do you want to talk about? You say, well, I want to talk about some bearings that are not operating properly. And what do you find wrong with it? It understands language. The Japanese are working on a little unit you wear around your neck. You can go to Japan and say, where's the nearest hill to me? Immediate translation of Japanese. You can go to Germany, flip it to Germany. So, where's the nearest hill? Or whatever you want. So, you won't have to learn a foreign language. Imagine going all over the world. What has caused me to hate urban sprawl? It also causes me to hate it, too. <laughs> because it, it is a poor solution to a problem. Now, the answer to that problem is very difficult for people to accept. It's called total enclosure systems. I don't know if you're not familiar with it. But there are many people that would rather live in a big hotel than an individual home because it's the gym, it's a theater group in the hotel, if it's modern. They have so much facilities in there. They're living in a hotel, you can just say, send up some, you know, two burgers and a coat, and it comes right up into your room. Now, living in a private home, you have to maintain the lawn and all that sort of thing. So some people may want to live in the future in a gigantic total enclosure. That's like an ocean life. Did anybody here ever travel first class on an ocean liner? Oh, a lot of poor people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when you're on an ocean liner, what happens is they come over to you and they say, would you like some fruit salad? All day long, everybody on that says there's going to be a tennis line. And everybody on that line, you don't have to write the captain. Say, hey, we were headed for Tahiti. I see snowflakes coming down here. <laughs> Gee, I'll correct. Then you write to the navigator. Who are these people in Washington that you're always writing with? How the hell did they get the job?